Hello again, folks, and welcome back to World War II TV and another week of unconnected but very interesting shows that all touch about World War II, of course. And I hope you watched the show we did yesterday about the incarceration of the Japanese Americans. It was a Sunday. We don't normally do shows on Sundays. If we did miss that one, go back and watch it because it was really interesting, if a little difficult to listen to at times because of the, the nature of what the subject was. But today, um, it's a show I'm looking forward to. I was just saying to Sean, our guest, I, there's two types of shows I really like. I like all of them, really. But the ones I really like are the ones I know a lot about, where I can join in with lots of opinions and questions, and the ones I know nothing about, so I just hand over to the present, presenter. The ones I, I find tricky are the ones where I know a little bit, because then I don't know whether the little bit I know is, is correct or wrong. Um, but the top today, though, is one of the show, the subjects I know very little about. So I will... Uh, apart from the fact I live in France and this has story has a connection with France, so I can maybe ask some things about that. I'm just going to basically hand over to our guest. So without further ado, my guest today is a serving British Army soldier. He's very much interested in European history, Spanish history, French history, bilingual works in Europe. Um, so um, his particular focus is the Spaniards who fought with the British Army in World War II and how they came. And it's a rather convoluted, complicated story of how they ended up coming to serve with the British Army. So um, I will now introduce my guest, so Sean Scullion. Good evening. How are you doing, Sam? Good evening, Paul. I'm well, thank you. So before we get into this presentation, I mean, I kind of t told a little bit about what your background is, but how did you first discover this story about the Spaniards who serve with the British Army? Well, actually, I, I was brought up in Spain as a, as a child and uh, lived under the, uh, the Franco regime, the last throes of the Franco regime and um, <clears throat> was living in Spain during the uh, during transition to democracy. And uh, I studied Hispanic studies at university and I was aware, having studied the Spanish Civil War and everything else, I was aware of large groups of Spanish exiles throughout the whole of Europe and the world and the wider world. Um, and really, um, I came across uh, uh, a book um, in the early noughties called uh, the Churchill Spaniards, Los, Los Españoles de Chultu. And, and, and that really is what got me going. This is a book written by a guy called Daniel Arasa. Daniel Arasa is an academic from the university, or he's now retired, but he has been an academic at the University of Barcelona. And he's written a series of books, uh, Spanish Civil War related, that are um, uh, also very much linked in to uh, exiles uh, out of Spain. So, so once I read this, I just went, hang, hang on a minute, what, what, where does this come from? And that's really when I started to get into the detail. I've spoken to Daniel Arasa on several occasions and other authors who've written very, 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 very little amounts about the Spaniards who are in the British Armed Forces. But Daniel covers basically Brits who were um, Sp Spaniards who were in Britain during the Second World War. Um, but I wanted to, being a being a soldier, obviously, I wanted to talk uh, and find out a lot more about the actual physical soldiers themselves. So I've tracked down, uh, I've basically tracked down about 900, and uh, well, I've actually got 908 names. Um, I think we're, we're probably talking about 1,200 uh, Spaniards in total, because I think there are some others, and I'll, I'll cover that tonight. I'll be able to cover a little bit more on that tonight. So that's the reason why, really. Well, I mean, that's a great start. And as, as you, I know from listening to your previous podcast, we're talking about a lot more Spaniards at the beginning, and the number kind of gets whittled down as they, as you'll explain, go off to their various locations and places and countries, because it is, and I hope the viewers will keep up with us, it is quite a complicated story, isn't it? I mean, it is, yeah. Well, sometimes when we're talking about the volunteers, you know, we're literally talking about people who live somewhere, and a poster goes up in their town saying, would you like to sign up for... And they sign up for, and the next day they are what it is they've signed up for. Yeah, this is not that at all, is it? This is a no. series of of interesting kind of political, military um, situations, effectively, Very much that, so, that yeah. forced them. And and we're using the word volunteer in to encompass all sorts of meanings because volunteer, yeah. you know, we get the same with the German, uh, the German Ostfront, Osttroop, and, you know, the, the people from Russia and Estonia and Poland, you know, some are volunteers and some are volunteers. It's a bit how yeah. the word is. So anyway, without further ado, as always, you, my guest has provided me with a PowerPoint, not masses of images tonight, but they have um, several images on the same slide. So I will hand over to Sean to kind of get going. And then if you've got questions about this, folks, because I do appreciate 
and so does Sean. This is a subject will be new to most of you. If you feel you need a bit of clarification, just put the question up in the sidebar and we can halt it and make sure that we're moving through this with anybody on board with it because, it, as I say, it is it is a bit complicated. Yes, yeah, so as uh, tries to say, um, uh, this, this, this story is all about those 908 Spaniards that I've found so far. And uh, the idea is, is this will become a book. I'm in the process of writing a book on this. Um, I hope to finish it by the end of the year. So it'll go into print at some point next year, hopefully, or maybe uh, the beginning of the following year. And, and the idea really is to tell their story. Their story, as I've said on a couple of the podcasts I've, I've done before, their story is very complicated. These are people who mostly were men of a fighting age between the age of 20 and 50. Um, uh, most of them were in their 20s. Uh, a lot of them were people, the majority of them, in fact, um, were people who had fought in the Spanish Civil War, in fact, pretty much all of them. And uh, a lot of these individuals were people who uh, ended up moving to very you know, unknown chartered territory for themselves, but while continuing this fight, and, and again, this is another thing, I, this is the working title I've got, is a continuing the fight, Spaniards in the British Army, 1939 to 1946. Still don't really have a title, but um, la, la lucha continua, you know, the fight continues, continuing the fight, it's that kind of thing, because because these are people who were fighting literally in warfare from 1936 to 1946. So it's it's quite an important thing. But if we move if, if we move on, I just wanted to start really with the next slide, which is um, all about the end of the Spanish Civil War and uh, a thing that we know uh, a lot of people know as la retirada, the, the withdrawal. And I've got a I've got a picture there of France. I've got a series of photos there, and what what you can see on this slide is really um, a pretty epic story. We've got. Roughly 500, 550,000 Spaniards who fled across into France or, or to North Africa at the end of the Spanish Civil War. And, and the French did make preparations for this, but actually were still very much taken by surprise when it did happen in early 1939. And we're talking about five groups of Spaniards who move into, into um, France or North Africa at some point between 1936 at the beginning of the Spanish Civil War and roughly um, April 1939. But the largest group, as I said before, is the group that ends up coming in, going into France in uh, between January and March 1939. And the map you can see there is the, the camps that were set up by, by France um, in order to hold uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, the, uh, the Spaniards. If we look at the, the the southern half of that map, that really gives you a feel for a lot of the camps that the the, the Spaniards ended up in pretty much straight away. And what, what we're looking at is these are internment camps, and and actually the the, the Spaniards and even the French authorities call them call them um, uh, well they call them concentration camps really. Um, and uh, it, it really was a, a horrendous period for the Spaniards as they made their way into France. You know, uh, Catalonia fell. The majority of these Spaniards, of whom about 220,000 were men of a fighting age from the Republican army, ended up crossing over on the Catalan side. And that's why you can see a big, um, a big um, uh, grouping of camps in the uh, in the in the bottom right hand corner there on the on the Catalan side. Yeah. Um, and really what you're looking at is you've, you're looking at a series of camps that are set up extremely quickly. These camps are set up. The, the Spaniards are then split up from their families. If they're there with their families, their children, their wives, um, or even their brothers or sisters or their uh, the grandparents or elderly, they're all split up. Those who are um, not men of a fighting age are sent further inland to other holding camps. But the majority of these Spaniards of a, of a fighting age are held in these camps. And then the um, uh, the French government starts to figure out what are they going to do with these uh, with these Spaniards. And um, we're talking, as I say, about uh, uh, around 200,000, 220,000 Spaniards of a fighting age. And it must be said that by the summer of 1939, we're probably looking at only around those 200 or so thousand staying in, in France. A lot of those had already crossed back into 
um, back into into Spain, although some of them did linger. So, so you could say probably safely by the summer of 1940, you're only talking probably in the region of about 150,000 Spaniards who are left in France. But actually, the reality is, is that these Spaniards were put into these internment camps and the French started to realise that they could make really good use of these Spaniards in order to be able to help with the, the French war machine. So just there was... Back up a little bit. Sorry to interrupt you, Sean, yeah. but just the, this, this flow of the Spanish across the border into France, yeah. is what happened to them what they were expecting to happen to them or were they expecting something different? What was... They, they, obviously, they're, they're saying that the Spanish Civil War has ended, they've got to do something, but what... What are they hoping for when they go to France? And did they did the did the reality meet their expectation? Uh, not at all. Um, in most cases, um, they didn't expect to be imprisoned. That's for sure. In turns, um, uh, and and of course, uh, a lot of people who who have followed the Spanish Civil War will be aware that one of the biggest um, uh, areas where um, the Republican Army uh, was that was faced with was a, a North African um, series of troops that were used by Franco. Um, Moroccan Moroccan uh, legionnaires, Moroccan troops were used. Well, actually, when a lot of these Spaniards ended up in um, uh, internment camps, they were guarded by North Africans and Senegalese troops. So for them, it became as a real shock. Also, they didn't really understand why a uh, French Republic was doing something like this to them. I, I don't have an answer to why the French did what they did. Uh, I, I really don't. Uh, but a lot of the accounts talk about um, a, a feeling of being being let, feeling let down by the French and feeling very much um, uh, alone, um, un, unsupported. And don't, don't get me wrong, there were lots of French families and French people who did help and quite a lot of the Spaniards who were able to go into France already had families there that were established and therefore were able to settle and not be interned. But you're talking still several hundred thousand Spaniards who were interned, um, and that did cause a huge problem. You know, And you can see the photos there. You, you've got the, the middle range of photos there. Um, you've got the troops, um, these, these um, people being interned on camps on the beach, on the Mediterranean coast, suddenly these camps having to, to pop up, these tents going up, it's the middle of winter, no sanitation, no food. These camps are then made a little bit more permanent um, and then they become, ironically, camps that a lot of the Spaniards end up going back into after France is taken by the Germans. And I'll cover that a little bit later because you can see the difference between Vichy France and, and um, let's say, um, occupied France and the no-go zone in the north, um, what you've got there is a series of other camps. Um, and uh, what, what ended up happening was, was that uh, some of these camps uh, were closed, but some of these camps were, were reinstigated when, um, when the, the Germans occupied that area. And I'll, I'll cover that in a little bit. But by the spring of 1939, the French had realised that they needed to make best use of this manpower. And of course, these 200,000 or so Spaniards knew they couldn't go anywhere. They, 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 some of them ended up making it to Mexico, and the Mexican government was very good at that, at, at taking on Republican exiles. But actually, a lot of these Spaniards, they were either going to stay in internment camps or be sent back to Spain. So what, would, what, what could they do? So the, the French came up with four options for them. They had four, the, four options. The first option is they could sign a contract and become a worker working for the French government in agriculture or industry. And you're talking about 40 to 50,000 Spaniards who did that. Then you're talking about um, Spaniards being offered the opportunity to become members of um, working labor companies, uh, CTE as they're called, Compagnie de Travailleurs Étrangères. And these working companies, very much like pioneers, um, were used by the French forces, um, the French armed forces, to work in, in certain parts of the French war machine. And I'll cover this a bit later on. And there's they, a whole precedent for that in the First World War, the Chinese you know, construction of the trenches. That's a, exactly. that's a standard very, European practice is to very use much so. other yeah. peoples for that physical labour that you need to, to maintain wars. Yes. And it's it's something that, again we've only begun to really acknowledge the Chinese involvement in the trench construction yeah. in, the, in comparatively recent years and all yeah. these other, well, the, you know, the, 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 the Africans and people like that in involvement. So it's, it's, it, there is a precedent for this, isn't there? Using yes, people so, yeah. 
a manpower for the war effort, but in a in a strangely kind of not military but kind of military, which I know you'll be going into detail. Yeah. Detail so later. these these um these Spaniards, you know, this is the only way they could get out of these internment camps. So that so they so they become um, prestataire militaire étrangère, pressed uh, military military foreigners pressed into service. And then they've got two other options. They can actually join the military. They could join the French Foreign Legion, or they be, they can become members of what, what what became known as Régiment de Marche de Volontaire Étrangère. They could become volunteers for the duration de la guerre um, in volunteer marching regiments. And there were twenty. There were three uh, marching regiments that were set up: the twenty first, twenty second, and twenty third marching regiments. Each of them with four battalions, and there were hundreds if not a thousand well there were thousands of spaniards in these in these volunteer uh battalions in regiments and also in the french foreign legion so by by the time this whole thing's got going uh, we're talking about fifty thousand or so spaniards in compagnie de travailleurs étrangères we're talking about 40 to fifty thousand spaniards in um in the industry and in agriculture and you're talking 10 to fifteen thousand spaniards in these um, volunteer marching battalions and in the french foreign legion and um uh, the rmves for example the volunteer um uh, um marching regiments these are, are mostly uh, organized in uh, camps on the Mediterranean coast, Bacares, which, which is on that map, and obviously a lot of the uh, the, the the Spaniards who end up going to um, going to uh, um, the French Foreign Legion, they sign on for a five year contract rather than just for the duration de la guerre, and they they are then um, uh, merged into uh, different, uh, put into different battalions and regiments, and end up going through the system in North Africa and end up going to lots of other places, which obviously I'll cover uh, a bit later on. So that, that's, that's really setting the scene of how all these thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of Spaniards end up in France. And then the next step, obviously, is some of these then becoming um, becoming uh, members of the armed forces of different other uh, other armed forces like the British Army. But actually, of course, the first thing that happens is the um, uh, the, the the Battle for France in 1940. So the, the next slide covers some of that. And I just wanted to go through some of that with you. So what we've got is is we've got a series of, um, of of things that happen. And if you look down that slide on the left hand side, you've got a couple of group photos there. You've got people who are um, uh, members of the RMVEs there. So that's people in the top top group there. They're members of one of the RMVEs. I think that was twenty two RMVE. Then you've got uh, members Spaniards in the French Foreign Legion. These ones were the ones that ended up in Syria. Then you've got um, some people down in the bottom left-hand corner in the R in an RMVE as well. This guy's a guy called Ricardo Obis, um, and as you can see, you've got um, you've got a, a series of badges. And if you work slightly left now, you can also see a guy in a French Foreign Legion outfit. This guy's um, name is uh, Francisco Geronimo. Francisco Geronimo joined the French Foreign Legion, ended up in North Africa, and then he's he, he was then sent to the Middle East and became part of the um, uh, French forces in Syria, um, and we'll cover him a bit later on. But if we if we now look at um, um, what happened, what was happening in France, you've got these RMVEs, which I've told you about already, 21, 22 and 23. These start to become uh, formed and then end up being involved quite heavily in the fighting in 1940. 21 RMVE, which has ha which has hundreds of Spaniards in, that's sent to the Verdun in 1940. Um, that fights in Verdun in 1940, and is actually um, something that's um, it, they, they are they struggle they they really really suffer quite a lot of casualties. 22 uh, RMV, they end up in Alsace initially, are uh, bypassed um, quite a bit obviously Maginot Line etc. But they end up then moving towards Paris and end up becoming part of that defence of Paris and defence um, further to the west um, after um, Dunkirk. Um, and, you know, we, we end up get, being in a situation where uh, that, that uh, regiment also becomes very badly uh, decimated or taken prisoner. And then we've got 23 RMV and they're formed very late in the day. And they're um, and you can see bottom right hand corner. There's a there's a group photo of them marching out from Bacares in uh, I think it's in March or uh, April 
1940, um, they end up being um, split up as individual battalions. And some of these battalions end up going to North Africa, but actually more so the, 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 the best known of these is what was to be the first battalion of 23 RMVE ends up being sent to Syria. Uh, and we'll cover that one uh, a bit later on as well. Um, another thing you need to be aware of is, is that by, um, the, uh, by the middle of 1939, a lot of Spaniards had joined the French Foreign Legion. And we, I think we're talking probably in the region of around 1,500 or so Spaniards by the end of 19, 1939, being members of the, Spanish, uh, of the French Foreign Legion and, and being absorbed and doing all of their training, then being absorbed and spread all over the French Empire, etc., to, to be part of those battalions and those and those infantry regiments. And most famous amongst those is the the, um, uh, the Spanish legionnaires who end up being part of the 13e demi brigade de la Légion étrangère, the, the 13th half brigade of the French Foreign Legion. They are formed in uh, formed in North Africa. They're um, trained to uh, become mountain troops and initially they are due to go to Finland to fight the Russians but actually they end up going to Norway and it is said that up to 600 Spaniards were in that half brigade of whom 300 or so end up uh, in Britain and I'll, I'll cover a, a bit more about them later um, but actually um, if we look at the top right hand corner the photo at the top right hand corner this is quite an interesting development here this is 185 Labour Company 105 Spanish Labour Company was a labour company that was formed um, at the end of 1939 uh, and they recruited fully uh, in, 90, in January 1940 and they were taken fully from the camp at Gurs. Gurs is a camp that was found in the uh, French Basque country, not very far from Bayonne, inland from Bayonne. And um, that company of about 250 Spaniards um, was seconded to the British uh, Expeditionary Force from January 1940. There are two um, Spanish Labour companies that I have found so far that had um, that were seconded to the BEF. 185 is is the um, is the most famous one. 185 is commanded by a uh, a pioneer captain um, who later becomes. Uh, company commander of the Spanish number one company, which I'll cover a bit later on. And they end up um, being um, formed. And in January, uh, at the end of January 1940, they move to Saint-Nazaire and they are there to support the, the rear area of the British Expeditionary Force. They work on railways, they work on warehouses, they do uh, uh, work on roads and they end up um, being part of um, the, the big machinery to support the British Expeditionary Force. The, 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 the British Expeditionary Force, GHQ in France, hadn't really figured out how um, how it was going to be able to find the manning for um, for a lot of the um, work required behind the British Expeditionary British Expeditionary Force lines, let's say, in the rear areas. And therefore, it did take on a, quite a lot of foreign workers to work in um, uh, foreign uh, alien uh, companies, as they were later called. And 185 is a really good example of that. And we know that um, we know we, we, we have a, a guy called Antonio Grande to, to thank for that. And Antonio uh, wrote a, um, a very famous, well, quite a famous book, called uh, the Spanish Number One Company. I'm afraid this is all in Spanish. He was in 185 uh, Labour Company uh, and he was one of 16 from that Labour Company that were able to escape France um, in, June 19, uh, in June 1940. So he's very, very lucky, one of 16. Um, what the other uh, members of 185 Labour Company, sadly, end up being... Uh, captured by the Germans. Quite a lot of them fell under German control. Some of them were able to get into what became um, Vichy France and therefore were, were, were kind of subsumed into the French system, the Vichy, Vichy system. But unfortunately, some of them were um, interned um, and it, it, um, I, I can't put my hand on my heart on this, but it is known that quite a few POWs, um, uh, Spanish POWs that were taken in um, uh, May, June 1940, either in CTEs or um, from units like the Spanish um, 185 Spanish Pine uh, Labour Company, were, were became slave labour and were, uh, were forced into slave labour in the Todd Group. 
Um, and some of them, sadly, also then became um, um, members of Mauthausen. Um, mm. And obviously, there, there's a there's a very long story of the the thousands. I think I think it's about six thousand um, Spaniards who were who were um, killed in Mauthausen concentration under, camp. Under the German it. the German system at that point, how did they? What classification were they? Because clearly, if you're a British infantryman captured near Dunkirk, you're a prisoner of war, you're a soldier. But this Spanish labor company, I mean, how 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 did how did they fit into the German system of what to treat with them? I mean, they just they had to kind of invent a new category to treat them. I, I guess pretty much, really. pretty much, they became rot Spanian. Um, there's a very big push at the moment to uh, make people understand the literally thousands several you know we're talking i don't know how many but several thousand spaniards who were forced into into slave labor by the germans the rot spaniard the red spaniards as they were called um uh, and uh the uh, the u-boat um pens in bordeaux for example were built pretty much fully by spanish um uh, todd group slave labor a lot of the um, Spanish um, uh, slave labour was used also in your neck of the woods, the Channel Islands. There's a there's a really good um, uh, book written by a uh, by a, um, uh, a Spaniard who was one of several hundred who worked in the Channel Islands slave labour. Um, it's a, a cracking book. Um, uh, Juan Dalmao. Um, he was one of several Spaniards who were used uh, as slave labour in the Tog group. Uh, specifically in Jersey, um, but actually quite a few were in Guernsey and in Alderney. Um, so yeah, so there, there, you know, there, there there are several of these Spaniards who are who are taken under the German kind of control, and of course, quite a few um, uh, named Spaniards, people that the Franco would have loved to have um, tracked down himself, were brought under German control as well, and and and. You know, um, Franco was, and it's it's very well documented now. Where Franco was very clear on, on wanting to make sure that these Spaniards were imprisoned, and he was quite happy for them to go to concentration camps. Sadly, um, and there a are list, a list of people he wants. I mean, I, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, so I, I'm I'm now, by the way, my hat hat off to you metaphorically, because I'm not going to take it off because the lively effect of my head for for keeping a track of this with your work, because I can't think of a group of a of two hundred thousand people who had a more diverse series of eventual. Well, it, it, really. gets, I mean, it gets it gets more interesting. Incredible. It gets I mean, more interesting as we go. Yeah, it gets more your, your interesting. Your desk as we go. must just be an absolute nightmare because yeah, that, uh, I won't I won't show way. you. I won't yeah, show you yeah. the rest of my desk. No. <laughs> It's good, good. Good luck with keeping all this under control. You know. Yeah. I mean, I'm not. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not covering that. I mean, th these are all rabbit warrens you can go down, and there sure, are people who are. There the are story. You've had to yeah. investigate all these 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 ends to to make yeah. the story make sense to you. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And and of course, the other thing I wanted to cover was just linked to this slide. And sadly, I don't think the pictures come out. But um, there are where the blank is. is yeah, I, I was wondering why they didn't come out. Yeah, there were eight thousand Spaniards who were linked uh, who were working in cte's uh sorry there were eight thousand uh people in cte's of whom about 1400 spaniards were part of these eight cte's working in the north of france in the nord region and four of those um uh cte's were involved quite heavily in the defense of dunkirk by the french now it turns out that some of these Spaniards were able to literally, some of them, row across <laughs> the uh, the channel or, or jump onto some boats by wearing British uniforms or French uniforms because obviously they were they were just enslaved. They were like you know wearing kind of labour uniforms. They weren't necessarily yeah. doing that. So so there is the story as well of the of the um, of the Spaniards who ended up. Um, being part of the defence of, of Dunkirk, the outer ring of Dunkirk, as Dynamo was in its last throes. That's where the majority of those slave labour came from, those 1,400. A large chunk of those slave labour came from those, and then the rest came from other parts of France that were taken by the, um, by the, by the Germans. However, in many ways... Uh, it could be worse if they were part of Vichy France, um, and, and I'll, I'll cover that in a bit. But um, before I before I go into that, um, just to finish off on this slide, really, uh, and I move into the, the first Spaniards who arrive in the UK. 
So we're talking about those 16 that end up in 185 Labour Company getting over to, uh, to Britain. They end up, because they're wearing British uniforms, they end up getting to San Jose Harbour. They're on the last boat out, which happens to be taken on by Polish troops. They're, so they're rescued by Polish troops. They're held in the Citadel barracks in Plymouth on arrival. And then eventually they then get um, put on to the books of the Pioneer Corps and join number one Spanish company. Now, a few of those individuals decide they don't want to become soldiers anymore and they end up working in the armaments industry. And quite a few Spaniards who came to the UK ended up doing that as well. Uh, I haven't really tracked that, that bit down. You've got the Spaniards who end up um, in Dunkirk and that area as well. And some of those are able to get away. Not all of those are, unfortunately, not that many of those are able to get to get into the British Armed Forces. They're sent back with a lot of the French to keep fighting uh, and go back through via Brittany, etc. Yeah. And sadly, a lot of those then become interned by the Germans, etc. Wow. So if we move on now to, to, to the next thing, which is the Spanish number one, number one Spanish company. The number one Spanish company is the only um, fully formed unit um, uh, that fights in British Army uniform throughout the entirety of the war. It's formed in September 1940 and it's disbanded in 1946, early 1946. It's made up mostly of Spaniards who were in the French Foreign Legion from the 13th Half Brigade who fought in Narvik. And it has a very, very interesting story. This this um this brigade this 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 group of soldiers, as I say, the majority about three hundred of them are Spaniards who have come from the um, French Foreign Legion. But you do get those sixteen I've discussed from from the A one eight five Labour Company. And ironically, when the when the company is formed, it has as its first office commanding uh, Captain now Major Smith, who was commanding one eight five Labour Company. So he is already in in good in good company. He 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 knows the Spaniards, having worked with them for six months. He knows how they work, and he becomes the first officer commanding, the first OC. But the story of the number one Spanish company is very interesting. They don't they're not they they don't uh, fight as such. However, some do, and I'll I'll talk about that as we go along. So you can see on on the the top left hand corner there, you've got the the photo of the. Um, uh, that's the fo fo a photo from the Pioneer Museum or the Royal Logistic Corps Museum now of the number one Spanish company's flag, 1940 until victory. And they had that flash on their on their arm, as you can see, that little diamond. And also the flash you can see here would also be could also be seen on their uniforms. Um, and let's be honest, they were more than happy to try and fly the Republican Spanish flag at every opportunity. <laughs> and they got in trouble for it quite a few times. Well, so, which, how... which is going to lead me to my next question. Sorry to interrupt your flow sure. now, because this, their status when they arrive in, in the UK, there's two questions there. One is if they have signed, now I know some of them are in the Foreign Legion, but some have signed this contract. If they sign the contract for the duration of the war, yep. is that for the duration of the war, or is that for the duration of the war within the French? Exactly, and that's a very good question. Now doesn't yeah. exist. So that's question that's a one. huge. That's a huge. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then and then I'll give you a second one. You can answer both. And the second one is Britain and its general fear of communism, because we're, you're using the word yeah. republican, which is a, is one way of putting it. But of yeah. course, other people would refer to them as communists, and yes. we know of the, the the in the resistance shows we've done. Basically, Britain sided with the de Gaulleist kind of res resistance, yeah. less so than the communists, because of this inherent fear of yeah. communism and then we can talk about yugoslav as well so there's yeah. two things going against at this point one is their classification what what are they yeah. signed up for what are their rights and secondly how are they regarded by the british authorities okay so 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 first of all when the um when the spaniards arrive uh from norway the, um, they come back to britain then they're, they're dispatched straight away to france they arrive back in the uk they're held in trenton park Barracks. That's where the French Foreign Legion were, were held. They're visited by de Gaulle on the, I think it's the 28th of, they arrive on the 20th of June 1940 and they, they are visited by de Gaulle on the 28th, asking, uh, calling them to join the French Foreign, the French, the Free French Army. Now, the problem here is, is that the Spaniards know that they are going to go into um, probable incarceration if they carry on in the French Foreign Legion. 
So 300 of these Spaniards decide that they're going to do a sit down protest as de Gaulle arrives. Now, actually, they are not allowed to get away to leave the French Foreign Legion because they've signed for a five year contract. And therefore, they should, in fact, stay in the French Foreign Legion. And some of those Spaniards who were in the 13th Brigade, who then leave, who then leave, do stay. Not many, only a few, probably only a dozen or so. But what ends up happening is is that a lot of the, the Spaniards who protest and other Spaniards in the 13th Brigade end up leaving um, uh, or being allowed to leave. But what happens is with these with these Spaniards is that um, they, they get they have this sit down protest and the French then put them because they're under French command in Britain. A bit of a tricky situation. The French, are, the British are standoffish. They let them carry on and do their own thing. The other thing is a lot of the officers who are now in charge of the Spaniards are no longer officers who fought with them in Norway. They are officers who've joined them from France. They don't understand that these Spanish Spaniards actually know what they're doing. So, so straight away, there's not that there's not another understanding. So they're put into Stafford prison. There are quite a lot of protests. And in fact, it's it's well documented in, in Hansard in uh, in the parliamentary papers. The uh, MP for um, for Stafford, I think, of uh, near Stafford, uh, Ashton Underline or something like that. He talks about them being imprisoned. Why? Why are they being imprisoned, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Then they are forced to go with the rest of the French on the first of July, um, who are going to embark from Avonmouth. And there's a standoff at the railway station. And what ends up happening is is that the French um, officers ring their, their um, senior officers back in London, not de Gaulle's, okay? Listen, it's not nothing to do with de Gaulle's side. These are, these are the Vichy French a chain of command in Britain, in London, and they get told, shoot one out of every three pour encourager les autres. Wow. And there's a huge standoff. And of course, the, the, the Spaniards, they're all armed and, they're, and they are willing to fight. And what ends up happening is, is that a British officer steps in and they then take over and these Spaniards are their main uh, members of the Pioneer Corps and they are part of, they, 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 they're formed in Westwood Ho in September 1940. Going on to your second question, they take them on. This MP I've talked to you about, he does mention there is a quite a big push in the summer of 1940 about aliens being part of the British Army. There's a pushback and there's also a push for why why aren't we allowing these people? You know, you, you've got you've got several um, uh, um, uh, I'm trying to remember Helen. Um, I remember her name. She's written a lot about uh, the, 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 the the Jews and the German speakers. Oh, Helen Fry. Yeah. Helen, Helen Fry. Fry. Yeah. yeah. So Helen Fry, exactly the same situation. A lot of these people were taken on to the books of the Pioneer Corps. A lot of the Jewish guys, a lot of the um, a, a lot of the, the Eastern European guys a lot of the uh, Germans and Austrians. The Spaniards were in the same boat. Um, so there was a, a lot, a, an awareness that actually a lot of these aliens, as they were called, could be uh, very, very useful. Um, but actually, um, because the Spaniards were probably the only ones who had been in full combat and had just arrived from the French Foreign Legion, the Spanish number one company was, was formed. Going on, carrying on with your second question, Yes, they were regarded as Reds. Actually, the majority of the Spaniards who were in the number one Spanish company were actually anarchists. They weren't actually communists. A lot of them were communists, a lot of them were socialists, but a lot of them were anarchists. And there's a really good example of one. If you look at the bottom right hand slide, you can see the guy, the guy on bottom left hand corner, the short guy, the sergeant. Uh, no, not him, a bit further to the right. Yeah, with his hands on his hands on his knees. That's right, the guy yeah. there, yeah. And Manuel Espallargas. Manuel Espallargas was an anarchist from a place called Teruel, but very well-known battle in the Spanish Civil War. He was in the Republican Army. He was in one of the uh, anarchist um, CNT, uh, the um, Confederación Nacional de Trabajo, the anarchist movements. He fought in one of the very well-known anarchist brigades. He fled into France. He joined the French Foreign Legion. The week before he was sent to Norway, he found out his wife had been lined up against a wall and shot because she was an anarchist as well. He was one of the senior NCOs. He got a king's commendation and was one of the Spaniards 
who was trained by the SOE. And this is where, you know, there was a lot of necessity involved. By December 1940, number one Spanish company was fully formed. It had started its training, but a guy called Major Hugh Quinnell arrived at their barracks in Plymouth, and he was in charge of H section of the SOE. He had actually realised that he needed Spaniards to help him with some potential operations that could be take could take place in the Iberian Peninsula. Britain was planning for the worst case scenario where Spain and Portugal would be taken by Germany. And really what we were looking at here is we're looking at a situation where they needed Spaniards that were ready to hand to help them. So the SOE turned to um, the uh, number one Spanish company and over 140 Spaniards from the number one Spanish company were trained by the SOE. Sadly, they were never used because Spain never entered the Spanish Civil War. And there's, that's another rabbit warren we could go down about yeah, indeed. You know, yeah. Spain being paid off and all of that stuff and, and Franco's uh, relationship with Hitler and all that stuff. Well, I'm thinking of doing a show about the, the neutral countries and kind of ranking them in how neutral they really were. Yeah. And what level of the war were they levels of neutrality? Because, you know, you have Irish neutrality, all the Irish volunteers signing up with the British Army, and you have yeah. Swiss and Switzerland and Sweden. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 It's complicated because neutral doesn't extremely just and of course the spaniards the, the spaniards sent over thirty thousand troops to fight over the course of the war to fight with the germans on the eastern front the uh yeah. the blue division so and we'll talk about blue division later bottom left hand corner the, the group photo there that is a group of spaniards um i think that's the third or fourth group that was being trained um by the soe um and again you can see second person from the left there's manuel espallargas same photo, same sergeant. He was regarded and he ended up being one of 22 Spaniards, sorry, one of 32 Spaniards who were selected to be used for operations later on in the war. And this is where I've drawn a bit of a blank and not been able to find out how many of those ended up being in operations. There are a couple of examples uh, and I'll cover one of those in a minute. But what's really interesting is, is that actually these Spaniards end up being involved one way or another with three other individuals, really quite famous individuals. One of them's Kim Kim Philby, one of them's Ian Fleming, and another one, which people probably don't know, is a guy called Peter Kemp. Kim Philby is one of the people who trains and evaluates these agents because of his because of his background. So he writes the reports on the Spaniards who are undergoing SOE training. So that, that's pretty amazing. Ian Fleming is one of the officers who writes the orders for the sconces, these Spaniards who are going to be uh, trained to, to fight behind enemy lines uh, uh, in groups, in small groups, small teams in the Iberian Peninsula, and those 140-odd were trained for that. Um, so in Fleming. And Peter Kemp, he is a Brit who was a, uh, a uh, training for the bar just as the Spanish Civil War kicked off. He was an ardent anti-communist. He decided to join Franco's army and he ended up in at the end of the Spanish Civil War in the Spanish Foreign Legion. War finishes and suddenly he's a member of the SOE. Oh, and suddenly, because of his Spanish background, he can be involved in these potential operations in the Iberian Peninsula. And at one point, they were looking at him being potentially a team leader of some of these Spaniards who would be <laughs> potentially that, that fighting against... a recipe for disaster. Uh, extremely. Yeah, I think they would have slit his throat yeah. straight away. So anyway, so there, so there you go. That's the number one Spanish company, uh, SOE-wise. You've got the other photos there. You've got some group photos. The, 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 the two photos above the SOE photo there, they're photos of the, uh, the company uh, working in uh, the Ardennes. They end up working a lot in forestry. They train in forestry with New Zealand, one of the New Zealand uh, forestry companies back in the UK. Um, the, the company's fully, fully formed again, let's say, by the beginning of 1944 after those guys have done SOE training. A lot of the guys who did SOE training weren't used, as I say, go back to the company. Um, and 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 obviously the, the the iconic photo is the one on the top right. That's the kind of the, the probably the largest group photo of the Spanish uh, number one company. This this is them in the in the forest. And that's the um, one that comes up on Google. <laughs> yeah, uh, oh, that's the iconic one. They're, they're, and they 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 basically are uh, landed um, in uh, Normandy uh, in you know, I think it's the eleventh or the thirteenth of August, nineteen forty four. They were going to land earlier, but because of the second Mulberry Harbour, they, they weren't able to, to, to land in the right order. So they, they end up landing there. They, they end up working 
um, on road work, road works and other other kind of uh, repair works uh, in France, Normandy, uh, uh, northern France. And then they get moved by um, October 1944. They get moved to the Ardennes just to the to the east of Brussels and they stay there for the rest of the war. They're basically there for nearly a year. They get reinforced by another 60 Spaniards who end up arriving from North Africa, and I'll cover them in a bit. But so, so the, the number one Spanish company disbanded in uh, early 1946, and those 300 plus members end up mostly settling in the UK. That is an amazing story. It's a, a story that I will cover in my book, but it's going to be another book in itself, I think. Sounds like it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, moving on then, we've, we've also now got the 63 Spaniards who ended up in the Middle East commandos. And this is another thing that people don't really uh, hit, know much about at all. The Middle East, Middle East commandos, let alone the Spaniards who were in it. So I mentioned earlier about the, um, the Spaniards who end up in the French Foreign Legion or in these uh, Régiment Volontaire, the Volontaire de Marche Étrangère. Well, a, a huge chunk of them end up being sent to the Middle East. They land, um, they land in, um, in, uh, in Beirut. Uh, they then go end up in, in a place called Baalbek in Syria. Now, what ends up happening is, is you've got a mix. You've got some Spaniards who are in the French Foreign Legion and they've been in the Middle East for a while, but actually the majority of the 63, around 50, and I still don't know 100%. I've actually, I was actually looking at the French Foreign Legion archives today. And I think I'm narrowing it down to how many were in one of these volunteer battalions and how many were actually in the French Foreign Legion. But anyway, they all end up one way or another in Baalbek. And what happens is, is that uh, once uh, Vichy France has taken over, let's say, these Spaniards are brought together and, uh, well, all of the units are brought together and they are basically told that there are probably going to be Germans coming to uh, take over elements of the command of Vichy, the Vichy French forces in the Middle East. And of course, the Spaniards immediately say, no way, we are getting the hell out of here. And it's very well documented that the Polish did this, um, who were in the French Foreign Legion, etc. already. So a lot of the Spaniards tried to do this. But of course, a lot of these were uh, some of the, the, the ones who were in the French Foreign Legion, they signed up for five years. But a lot of these were also there for the uh, duration de la guerre. So as far as they were concerned, the war was over. They were no longer fighting the Germans because France had capitulated, so, so, so they wanted to leave. Have become invalid, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so a lot of them end up trying to escape uh, or trying to leave. Now, sadly, a lot of them are incarcerated. The, the, it's quite well documented. About three hundred or so Spaniards are put in prison, um, and in homes, and they end up being imprisoned there. But actually, a, a, a large chunk of Spaniards, probably all from the um, sixth uh, battalion which was this battalion that had been formed in France as volunteers, not from French Foreign Legion. These 50 or so, they steal a couple of trucks and they drive to Palestine. Um, and there's a bit of a story. Um, uh, one of the guys um, who, uh, who I'll cover in a bit, a guy called Joaquin Fajardo, he jumps out of the truck. He smacks the border guard with his weapon and the, and the trucks are able to drive through the border. There's a bit of an altercation and he's able to kind of control the situation. They then end up and they all volunteer, you know, to join the British Army. There are another couple of groups that end up in Jordan um, and also in Palestine who cross over the border on foot. I think these are probably members of the French Foreign Legion who, who do that. I'm pretty sure one of them is anyway. Anyway, in the end, what you get is, is you get these three, 63 Spaniards. They all arrive and they are sent to... Um, uh, Egypt, basically, um, they end up being interviewed by uh, somebody who became quite famous later on, a guy called Lieutenant George Young, uh, Royal Engineer Officer. He was a major at the time um, and a, a Captain Harry Fox Davies. And th these two are the, the key founding members of 50 Middle East Commando. And um, the Spaniards are all put on the books of the Queen's Royal Regiment, West Surrey, 1st, 5th Battalion to start with, but they immediately become members of the newly formed um, 50 Middle East Commando. 
and they're, uh, they then end up in Jenifer, um, and the um, the 50, 51 and 52 Middle East commandos are also formed. And you can see the badge there of the Middle East commando. They didn't have, they had a, a strange badge uh, in as far as they had a flash on the arm, and they also had this, um, this dagger. It wasn't the commando dagger, it was called a fanny. Um, the story is, is that that was something, it's a knuckle duster with a blade. These were, these were Middle East specific, um, made to order in Egypt for the Middle East commandos. Uh, you've got a guy above that, that there, a guy called Manuel Surera, um, who became a member of 50 Middle East commando. Really good example of somebody in uniform. So they're wearing, they're wearing kind of Scottish headgear, but with a, with a cap badge and then the Middle East commandos um, on either side. Um, so quite an interesting mixture of uniform there. Obviously, the Fanny became their kind of dagger of choice, just like the commandos later on um, with with a with specialist commando knife dagger. Um, and anyway, they start the training um, and 50 Middle East commando um, ends up um, being a bit on the bus, off the bus with certain operations. In January 1941, um, uh, uh, and you can see that dark group uh, dark group photo just to, yeah, that one there. Top, yeah, that's uh, the Spaniards who end up um, going to Crete in early 1941 to reinforce the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the kind of garrison there. They end up doing um, some patrolling and things like that there and helping the garrison there. And then they're brought back um to um uh back to 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 uh to egypt um and really what you're looking at is is, is uh, uh quite a lot of training going on and there's a couple of more photos on the slide there of 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 them training you can see um bottom middle there and bottom left so you can see the them in the the bottom middle there's a group photo there of them in um in the the sweet lakes um in near their base doing landing training etc and obviously you've got a good old photo of them um next to the pyramids etc um there um so what then happens is is that um 51 and 52 commando at the time have been doing other things they've been in abyssinia they've been doing other other operations they come back and by march 1941 lay force with bob laycock famous for the setting up of the commandos generally he actually ends up being somebody who um forms lay force that then ends up being quite an important starting point for what then became the SAS and the special forces in the Middle East, long, long, long range desert group, et cetera, et cetera. F 50 commando is merged with 52 commando because of one reason or another, uh, injuries due to operations, illness, et cetera, et cetera. And it becomes D uh, battalion of lay force and B company of that uh, um, um, battalion has a troop which is actually 60 strong, which has got the Spaniards in it. And that that uh, that troop is headed up by then by a guy called Bob McGibbon. He commands them and he's got two, um, he's got two lieutenants. Uh, uh, one of them is called Russo and I'll cover him a, a little bit later on. So by the end of May, um, Crete has properly kicked off with the airborne landings and lay force is sent to, to Crete. D battalion, uh, and A Battalion. D Battalion lands on the 27th of May uh, and ends up being thrown into the mix straight away. It's a company, It's a, the battalion is used as the rear guard to protect the force as it's moving from north, from Suda Bay to Sfakia in the south. And sadly, B Company ends up being the rear guard of the rear guard at uh, uh, over the, the 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 space of one night in particular, um, the, um, the the now CO Lieutenant Colonel um, George Young decides he needs to have a company covering the withdrawal of the rest of the battalion as it sets up a really good defensive position to harass the enemy further down in a place called Babani Halli. So what ends up happening is is that B Company is let's say sacrificed to a certain extent. And Bob McGibbon is taken prisoner along with some of the other some of the Spaniards. But actually, by the 1st of June, Sfakia is where most of the British troops are. And by then, the um, uh, the decision is made to uh, surrender 
and 37 of the Spaniards out of that troop are taken as POWs. Um, George Young uh, has to do the surrender um, in Svakia and he ends up being taken prisoner and whisked off to Germany. And George Young becomes quite famous because um, he ends up being the chairman of the escape committee in Kolditz. Mm. Um, quite a well-known story. I knew, I knew the name there. So I was yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so just, I'm just a ask a question here, Sean. Yeah, I, go on. I, I feel it's my turn to talk and give you a bit of a break for a few seconds. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is, with, with the commandos, that were the various commando units that are being set up in 41 and 40, well, even 40, there's kind of two types I would kind of broadly define. There's the commando volunteer who's just simply physically tough and a good soldier and wants to do something better Yep. than with a regular unit then you have the other unit commandos that are the kind of specialist ones like helen fry talks about the german germans or german jews or there's the inter-allied commandos so they've got specialist knowledge of a particular country what do yep. the british think is the the particular thing the spanish bring to the table is it is it their it, experience it, a lot language? actually yeah no a lot a lot uh, well first of all you've got to remember 1551 commander especially more so 50, were all volunteers from other units. The Spaniards were the only ones that were non-British volunteers, let's say they were, they were Spanish stroke French Foreign Legion volunteers instead. But actually the reality is that the Spaniards, they were used to the heat because of Spain. You know, you've got to think, yeah. you know, Spain's got a pretty, pretty nice, they had already been in the Middle East for a long time. A lot of them had been there, you know, quite a few of them had been there for, for six months or more um, and were used to long marches, uh, in the desert, you know, the French Foreign Legion, famous for its long marches in the desert. They were also really good at living off the land. They were very good at survival skills. The Spaniards, and it's it's um, it's brought up a lot in uh, Evelyn War. He right, was the yeah. intelligence officer for 50 Middle East Commando. And he writes, uh, there's a section in his diaries about 50 Middle East Commando, and he does mention the Spaniards being very good at finding, suckling pig for him and everything else. I mean, I, this, I know this is reminding me very much, it's a dimension of show I did last week, of, of what we learned about the Alamo Scouts. In, the, in the, their needs in the Pacific, they used lots of Native Americans because they had this ability to live off the land, they were used to the, the climate in yeah. Arizona, and it's, it makes sense because we know from the British Army's experiences in World War II, conditioning men for a theatre of war that you're not used to takes time and you look yeah. at the look at the british army in burma for example so if as you say you've got people who are already attuned to the climate already attuned to that kind of as you say distance marching living off the land it makes sense they're suitable yeah. commands. I'm, I'm glad i asked the question because that's that's that i'm, I'm happy yeah with this i mean I, I know that i mean you know typical stiff upper lip british stuff people like george young and his regimental 2ic uh rose um i can't remember his first name um anyway they they both think well they weren't necessarily up to scratch compared to the british um and i'm sure they weren't in some ways you know have a few bits a few glasses of wine and i'm sure there are a couple of incidents uh, of them in alexandria there was a shooting incident one of the spaniards shot uh, two frenchmen mostly because he knew who they were because they were people that he'd been with in syria you know there was this there was this amazing mix of cultures in the middle east there all yeah. these different nationalities coming together some of them their pasts would catch up with them if you know what i mean so yeah i mean um but I, ironically what you what you're talking about is if you look at the middle, middle, top middle, where there's a guy with a beard, yeah, him, that, that picture there. The guy on the left is a guy called Francisco Geronimo. Francisco Geronimo was in the French Foreign Legion. He was one of the people who escaped by foot to cross into Jordan. He joined 50 Middle East Commando. He was in Crete, but his story really then became amazingly interesting. It was already interesting, but it became even more interesting. He then spent the next 11 months escaping and evading the Germans on Crete. He was rescued by the um, SOE in a, in, a, uh, in a planned operation. He was one of, one of several people who were rescued by, by a boat. He then became um, uh, a member, carried on being a Middle East commando, um, and was part of the special um, special service regiment, the precursor to the SAS, and was involved probably in operations between the summer of 1941 and early 1943. And then he became a member of the second SAS, and he 
he fought in, he, he, uh, he was in operations in France and in Italy. And I'll, I'll cover some of the operations he's involved with a bit later on. So 30, 37 Spaniards are taken prisoner. Bottom right hand corner, you've got some of the paperwork of one of those prisoners. And that's that's um, Joaquin Fajardo. I talked to you about Joaquin Fajardo earlier, the guy who'd dished somebody in the, in the shins on the border. Well, that's his uh, prisoner paperwork. And interestingly enough, this is where the story gets quite interesting. Two things happen. The first thing is when they arrive in Thess Thessaloniki, they are they are very, very worried that they're going to be found out as Spaniards. Their MO says, just pretend you're Gibraltarian. So that's what's on all of their paperwork. So you can see that on the paperwork there. It says Fajardo, Joaquin, 2nd of March, 1919, Gibraltar. Mm. So that's the first story. That's quite interesting. Second story is, of course, they then get taken to POW camps. And if you zoom out again, you'll see top right hand corner. There's a typical photo of some of those Spaniards, um, not all of them. Uh, the, the shortest guy, third from the right uh, with a jointy hat. That's Joaquin Fajardo there. They end up in Poland. They end up in Germany. But the, 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 one of the most amazing stories for me, where you get people meeting their their past, Joaquin Fajardo is working on a, a railway line near a railway station in Germany. And basically what happens is a train pulls up. All these guys in German uniforms are leaning out and talking and smoking. He picks up a load of rocks. He starts throwing them at the train, starts swaying, tries running towards, he gets rugby tackled, he gets pulled down by the other POWs. Turns out the people on the train are members of the Spanish Blue Division going to the Eastern Front. Wow. So, you know, quite an amazing little bit of story. Then that's been that's been corrobor corroborated by two other people. So I'm definitely including that in the book. So 15 Middle East Commando. The final thing I wanted to say is what happens to the 20 or so who end up getting away from Crete? Well, I've already spoken about um, the, the prisoners of war. Sadly, two of those die um, in, in prisoner of war camps from, from a, a, a bombing raid. But the other 20 or so, two of them end up um, joining the SAS. Four of them end up rejoining the Queen's Royal Regiment, um, West Surrey, and about 15 or so end up in the Pioneer Corps, but that's only in 1943. And the big mystery is what happens between June, July 1941 and April 1943. Quite that's a gap. the big mystery. <laughs> and, and I am fairly certain that they were being used as part of um, the... Uh, as part of the um, uh, Special Raiding Force, Special Service Regiment, uh, Commando type raids. Uh, but I just can't prove it. That, that, that's, that, that, that's that iffy period, isn't it? When the when the the, the the units haven't quite reached their final designations, yet a small scale raiding force. S exactly. All of the that SBS stuff. hasn't. So, yeah, that's that interesting period where it's the shakedown still happening, and it's yeah. lots. We talked about it before. It's often who you know rather is, yeah. is so important because you exactly, say, exactly. Oh, i've got a unit that i've started lots of and it, it actually got to a point where it's actually getting a bit uncontrollable wasn't it people say we've got too many private independent units now we need yeah yeah definitely it. and um i mean i think the only one that sticks out to me is potentially some of them being involved in operation flipper which was the one to try and kill rommel which didn't go too well and only mm. somebody like late i think it was late laycock and a few others um but yeah, um, you know, it's it's quite a it's quite a quite an interesting story. Anyway, sorry, going going on a little bit further. Then um, next slide. So here we have uh, Spaniards in North Africa. Now I don't have much more than these group photos to show, but this is very much linked in. You know, I said there were uh, some Spaniards who ended up being in um, escaping to North Africa. Well, 15,000 or so Spaniards uh, were able to get away. A lot of them were members of the Republican Navy. A lot of them were interned. And then when Vichy France was fully established, loads more were sent to North Africa to penal colonies, to concentration camps, they, they ended up um, being involved in the building of the Trans-Sahara Trans Trans Railway. They were working in horrendous conditions. One of the most famous and worst camps was Jelfa. Top left-hand corner, typical group photo there um, of, the, of the conditions there. They didn't they lived in tents. Uh, the winter was horrendous there. The summers were, were really bad. 
This is an early photo. This is like 1939, 1940. Um, and this is from a guy called uh, Obis, Antonio Obis. Antonio Obis was, is a really interesting character, and I'll, I'll cover him a, a bit later on. So, so what ends up happening is, is that we get to a situation where Operation Torch happens, 7th, 8th of November, 1942. And you've got a thing called Project uh, uh, Massingham. Project Massingham was this joint operations between the Americans and the British OSS, the American um, kind of uh, special service, and the and the SOE, and there there is a lot of evidence to prove to show that Spaniards were involved in a lot of behind the lines um, sneaky beaky sabotage on behalf of the OSS and the SOE in the early days of um, Operation Torch. Um, Colonel George Eddy, people like that, they were recruiting a lot of these people. And they were using these people because they have these skills. Some of, a lot of these people had been working a lot with explosives already in the Spanish Civil War. Um, some of them were, were, you know, brigade commanders, battalion commanders. They really knew what they were doing. From November 19, uh, 1942 onwards, a lot of these camps start to get liberated. And uh, a series of intelligence officers from British intelligence, SOE, end up going into these camps. And it's very well um, documented as well. You've got um, uh, the picture there, the guy standing up with his hand on his on his belt. He, his name is Agustin Roaventura. Agustin Roaventura, he, um, he was in Jelfa. He was one of the 400 or so Spaniards in the concentration camp at Jelfa. And he joined the Pioneer Corps. But he documents in his memoirs, and I've been very lucky, his family have given me uh, a copy of his typed up personal memoirs. Prolific writer. Um, very, sadly, they're not available, but I'm hoping to publish some of his, some of his memoirs in the future. Agustin Raventura, another anarchist, heavily politicized, um, escapes into France. Helps out with the with the um, uh, helps out um, helps out with the resistance. Gets arrested, held in a camp in France, then gets sent to Jelfa because he's an undesirable. He ends up being part of the five to six hundred or so Spaniards who then end up being members of the Pioneer Corps, and we're talking about. A, a lot of companies here. We're talking about literally dozens and dozens of pioneer companies being set up, of whom we can number 337, 338, 339, 361, 362, 363, 364, 401. They're ones that have Spaniards in, and some of those only have Spaniards in. And there are some amazing stories about language barriers. Some of these companies have five or six nationalities, British officer put in charge. Everybody can speak French, so they communicate in French, or only some can speak French, some can speak English. So it's, it's an absolute nightmare. Um, but a really, really amazing stories of how these Sp Spaniards then get integrated into the British Army through the Pioneer Corps. And what ends up happening is, is that a lot of them end up working in Algeria, Tunisia, and to a certain extent, Morocco. They end up doing very similar work to what 185 Labour Company was doing in France. They end up working in the ports, they end up working in railway yards. Um, some of them end up guarding prisoners of war. They have a lot of issues with guarding trains because the French are trying to rob from the trains. There's a couple of incidents where Spaniards are uh, not found guilty of shooting Frenchmen. Um, there's a few confrontations between some of these Spaniards and the French uh, to do with robbing and things like that. But what, when, what ends up happening is some of these Spaniards end up going as pioneers to support Sicily and some of them end up going to Italy as well. But three of those companies, 361, 362, 363, sorry, four of those companies, 361, 362, 363, and 364, end up going to the UK. And 361 company is where Agustin Roaventura comes in, and he's quite heavily involved in other things in the UK later on. I'll cover him a bit later on. But what ends up happening is 60 members of that um, uh, company end up being then posted to number one Spanish company and support number one Spanish company in the Ardennes in Belgium in 1944-1945. So, and then the rest of, of the work that the pioneers do in the UK is mostly working in munitions factories, storage yards, ports, and everything like that. Basically doing, by the time that we're coming to the end of 1944, which is when they arrive, it's all about the end of the war and uh, about stripping things down. And a lot of these people 
don't get demobilized until 1946 or 47 because they're doing a lot of that final stripping out work stuff's being backloaded you know and everything else so they're, they're, they're you know they're still quite important to uh to making sure that the war machine is is working so a lot of them get demobbed and um you know uh uh, Antonio Obis, who, who I mentioned before, he's in the middle photo there. Uh, he stood. He's the one who's on the left-hand side um, with his arm and uh, finger on the shoulder. He becomes a commando. Uh, he's trained as a commando, and he's literally on a boat on the way to Burma when the war ends. Um, he volunteers to cross over to the British Army fully and becomes a trained commando. He's a Bren gunner. Um, uh, uh, sadly, he dies a few years after the war, um, uh, very ill, which is very sad. Um, but, um, but yeah, um, some amazing stories there. And these Spaniards again, um, the, the, the big story though, which, which, which will happen, I'll talk to you about a little bit further on is, is a lot of these pioneers that end up in Britain, what happens to them at the end of the war. Anyway, moving on, um, next slide to Spaniards in the SAS. So I've actually tracked down eight Spaniards who were in second SAS. Now, this is fairly well documented, but nobody has actually brought them all together. And the stories of these individuals are absolutely fascinating. So I've already spoken to you about Francisco Geronimo. Francisco Geronimo changed his name to Frank Williams, and I'll talk to you about the name changes as well. You've also a guy called, got a guy called Justo Valerdi. That's the guy, um, middle right, uh, young lad there. Um, he changed his name to Robert Bruce. Then you've got a guy called Juan Torrens, who changed his name to John Coleman. A guy called Angel Camarena, who you can see uh, with his hands on his hips there in that middle middle left photo there. Yeah, uh, that's Angel Camarena there. And then you've got uh, a guy called Francisco Revuelta, who changed his name to Robert Shaw. Sorry, Angel Camarena changed his name to Alan Cooper. Then there's a guy called Serra. Don't really know much about him. Then there's Rafael Ramos, and we'll talk about Rafael Ramos in a minute. Then you've got a guy called Martin, don't know much about him. And then finally, a guy called Enric Boganim, who changed his name to uh, Henry Hall. And what's now, your, sorry to interrupt again, what's your, um, uh, I'll get my words out, Paul, the the, the, name, the name change, because it's one of those things, because we, you, we have certain members of Pathfinder units in Normandy who change their names. And it's one of those things you hear different reasons for name <laughs> change, because it, it, it was something that happened quite a lot within these uh, aliens, as we would use the word, then joining the British Army. Now, yeah. in the terms of Jews, of course, it's for the, completely for their protection should they be captured. So you have people yeah. obvious with, with dog tags with, with Church of England or something on it to protect yeah. them. But in the case of the Spaniards, is it integration or is it protection or a bit of both? It's a bit of both. Um, the Obviously, just like the, the Middle East commandos guys, they feared you know, they always had that fear in the back of their minds about if they got captured, would they be sent back to Spain or would they be sent to a concentration camp or, or some sort of internment? Yeah. So there was always that. There is a story, of course, which is that they were all in a bar and they all decided that they were going to change their names and they wanted to become kind of famous pop stars, famous kind of film stars of the time. Hence why Juan Torrent decides he's going to be called John Coleman, because he looked a little bit like Ronald Coleman, who right. happened to be a, a film star who had been in the you know, Foreign Legion. And, and let's be honest, that. British officers, unlike yourself today, who has a wonderful Spanish accent, would not have had much patience for listing out on parade the names of all these Johnny foreigners. They, <laughs> they'd have been giving them names like that they could say, like, if it's yeah, no, you're right. right. Yeah. They become Harris or Jones because exactly. that would be their and, and, Yeah, and the lists of the, the nominal roles of the units with Spaniards in, the, the you know, the spelling mistakes are very normal. So, yeah, totally agree. You know, Francisco Geronimo, he, he wanted to change his name to Walter Raleigh or Francis Drake, but he ended up Frank Williams because Frank is similar to Francisco it's and Williams name. is a fairly easy name to... Uh, it turns out he, he ended up, you know, settling down in Wales, so it worked out quite well. Justo Balerdi wants, you know, Robert Bruce. So he, he got away with that. Uh, and then, you know, the others the same. So the only person who didn't change his name was Rafael Ramos. And Rafael Ramos, that's his, me that's his medals there. Uh, Rafael Ramos, um, probably the most experienced out of all the Spaniards in the SAS. He had, I think it was four or five operational jumps with the SAS. He, you know, he really did, uh, uh, um, you know, make a big difference. He got awarded the military medal. I'll, I'll cover that in a minute. But the, so you've got 
two individuals, Justo Valerdi, who you can see just there on the top right, and, and um, uh, Francisco Geronimo, Frank Williams. You've got the two of them coming from the Middle East commandos. The others are all coming from joining the Pioneer Corps in North Africa and then volunteering for, for special duties, going through some um, sort of um, uh, initial training and initial selection, and then ending up in 2nd SAS as it was properly formed in early 1944. Because by 1944, we're talking about a brigade, we're talking about five regiments of the SAS, one and two SAS were predominantly British, although obviously second SAS was a real international uh, regiment. Three and four SAS were Spanish, oh, French, sorry, and um, five SAS was Belgian. And I've also found another six or so Spaniards in three and four SAS who had been in the Free French Army, French Foreign Legion beforehand. So, you know, I'm going to interrupt another question. I'm for fear of Sorry. going down a rather rabbit hole, and I don't know Sorry. how long the show is going to take, but whatever, I'm enjoying it. Is <laughs> these eight people that we are, you're talking about now, do we have any idea about what their motivations are in a simple way? Because, you know, if you're, for example, a Frenchman in the French SAS, your motivation is to restore your country to, to democracy and get rid of the Nazis. Fairly clear cut what yeah. you're doing it for. But these guys, it's a little bit more confusing what they would be obviously they're fighting fascism yeah. quote unquote but do, do have they even written down what it was they felt they were signing up for or with or i think um i think there's a little bit of two things really the first thing is yes they wanted to continue that fight against fascism they were very heavily politicized um for example juan torrents who who changed his name um <laughs> who changed his name to john coleman his his son cliff talks quite a lot about the fact that they were all very heavily politicized and really they were very keen on making sure that um that you know uh, they were kind of taking it to the next level but i think also from what i've read so far and looking at their motivation and the way they fought and they're all very brave men just like anybody else who was in the sas or anybody else in the armed forces in the second world war let's be honest about it um they i think they were kind of you know soldiers soldiers anyway i think you know a lot of them had fought in the spanish civil war a lot of them had been in the french foreign legion or in in um in 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 battle beforehand and they just felt that you know this was what they wanted to do well, it, now, it, it, after a certain number of years it just becomes kind of a career choice in a bizarre it does, way it does it's, it's what you've become good at like yeah. the sergeant in the wild geese is, I'm a soldier. It's what I do best. It's that kind yeah, of yeah. And I've had conversations. Yeah, I've had conversations with people about this before. And and in some ways, with some of those individuals in the SAS, I think that is the case. I think that really is the case. But if we talk about um, so so they so they they all do that. Let's just talk about Angel Camarena, the guy in the middle there. He his story is amazing as well. Angel Camarena was actually a soldier in the Spanish army before the. Spanish Civil War kicked off. He was a teenager. He'd only just joined. He was in the engineers. He joined, uh, he became a, uh, a driver in the driver pool in the T Tenerife garrison in the Canary Islands. Based in Tenerife, Tenerife, before the Spanish Civil War and the Spanish Civil War kicked off, was Franco. The story goes that he actually drove Franco a few times around as his chauffeur. I can't prove that. I'm still waiting for his um, his records come back from the Spanish archives. But the family are fairly sure that he did. He certainly has memories of uh, pushing the swing of his daughter uh, in the garden, possibly. So that's quite incredible. However, what is sure, and, I, and again, this is all very well recorded, is that he is condemned to death that year, that summer. He's condemned to death, along with 19 others. Well, him, he, he was one of 19. And luckily, he survives. He's able to survive because when he's taken out on board, and I think, I think we're talking 15 or 16 out of those 19 are shot, he's taken out on board of a prison ship to be shot, and a British ship is going by at the time. He makes good his escape, dives overboard. He's taken on by the British ship, and then what ends up happening is, is that he's then handed over back to the Spaniards on the agreement that he's not going to be killed. He's then interned. He's sent to an internment, a concentration camp, a, you know, a horrendous place in Morocco. And he's there until 1941. He's then released. Franco had a series of pardons uh, and they were all announced in 1941. 1941 was the first big pardon he gave. So he was released as a political prisoner of war, political prisoner, what do you want to call him? Anyway, he then goes back to Spain to visit his family, realises it's not for him. He ends up in North Africa and he then joins the Pioneer Corps 
and then joins the SAS. And he is involved in operations in, nor in, in north, northern um, France, and he's on a, a, a quite a famous operation called Operation Archway, which is when the uh, SAS drove all the way into Germany, across, across the Rhine, into Germany, did deep operations behind uh, the enemy lines um, wh where they could find them, because by that stage it was, it was pretty much the, the end of the war. And there he is in Germany with one of the other SAS troopers. Uh, and the final thing I want to talk about, really, is uh, Tombola. And this is where uh, Rafael Ramos comes in. Operation Tombola, an audacious operation behind enemy lines in North Africa. Uh, and what we're looking at is um, three Spaniards involved. Rafael Ramos, Justo Balerdi, who you can see there, and Francisco Jerónimo. Roy Ferran, famous SAS uh, commanding uh, officer commanding of one of the SAS squadrons, he comes up with his idea of attack, doing a series of attacks to divert the Germans from um, being able to concentrate their forces on, on, on what was left of the Gothic line. And basically what we're looking at there is an audacious attack, especially on the 54, 51st Mountain Corps headquarters um, in Reggio Emilia. And this is a good photo here. And you can see in the middle, the guy leaning back with his hands kind of semi his pockets, that's Justo Balerdi there. Sadly, Justo Balerdi dies. He's killed by machine gun fire and he's buried in Milan Cemetery. But the attack on 51st uh, Mountain Corps uh, headquarters is, is, is amazing. Roy Ferran parachutes in uh, a, a piper so that they're paying, they're playing Highland Laddie as the attack goes in. He's got partisans, he's got Russians, he's got SOE, he's got SAS troopers. The attack goes in. Rafael Ramos is part of the attack on one of the, the villas. He goes in, he's personally responsible for dispatching six German officers on his own. He rescues one, uh, uh, the, the op, I think it's the uh, intelligence officer, manages to take him out. He's injured. He's been shot in the back, takes him out and then rejoins the fight in the building, carries on fighting. Then when the fighting starts to die down, he then with another trooper puts the captain on a ladder and escapes and evades the Germans for two days before joining the SAS contingent again later on. He gets awarded the, the military medal. Very, very brave man. Bottom left-hand corner, you've got a picture of five of the Spaniards um, meeting up um, in um, uh, back in the UK near Colchester, um, where the um, second SAS uh, Ivanhoe is now. I think it was what it's called, Wavenhoe, whatever. I always remember, never remember the name. He he ends up um, uh, being part of that group that are saying goodbye. Um, and obviously, if you look at the rest of the other slides, you've got a group photo there, uh, top left of the um, the 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 Italian contingent of the SAS and those three Spaniards are in there. The guys to the right of that, that's the that's the, the Spaniards and some of the other foreigners doing their parachute training. To this day, I don't understand why they're wearing parachute regiment badges, but they are. Um, maybe it's maybe I don't know. I, I really don't know. But you can see their bottom right uh, with a slopey ver slopey beret with his hands out a bit like that. That's Juan Torrents there, guy with his uh, 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 arm on a shoulder there. That's Rafael Ramos. And then the next one is Enrique Boganim, you know, and some of the other Spaniards are intermingled there. So, you know, the Spaniards are very heavily involved. And as I say, um, sadly, Justo Valerdi plays the, plays, plays, the, plays the ultimate price. But the other Spaniards, you know, are heavily involved uh, and they, they do a good job and they do operations in France and Germany as well, as I said before. So that's that's the SAS, the guys in the SAS, Rafael Ramos, um, you know, quite an interesting story, really. And, you know, you could write a book just on that in itself. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking how on earth you're going to rein in your book and keep it under... You <laughs> short know. paragraphs, short, short, pithy paragraphs. Um, it's going to be basically make Peter Caddick Adams books look like pamphlets. <laughs> come, <laughs> it'll come, yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll see how we go. We'll see how we go. The first book is really about introducing these groups. I mean, basically, the, the, the slides I've gone through, the groups of people I've gone through there are really chapters to yeah. my book. My, my book's going to be about eight chapters. This is, I, I haven't really got a name for, for this, this slide, really. This is more the brave few. It's about some of the individuals. They're not members of, they're not part, big groups of people. You've got two Basques, uh, Jose Idala, picture you can see there. You've got a guy called Lucio um, Sauquillo Echavarria. They're Basques. Now, a lot of people don't know, but 
4,000 Basque evacuee children were evac evacuated to Britain in 1937. About four to 500 of those were still living in Britain at the outbreak of the Second World War. And some of those volunteered to become members of the armed forces. Two of them, I've tracked down here, became part of the airborne forces. The one in the, the parachute regiment guy there, yeah, the, the, uh, the, 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 the gravestone, not the guy to the right, I'll talk about him in a minute, but the gravestone there, that's uh, Lucio Salquillo. He is part of um, the, um, tenth, the 12th parachute battalion, um, uh, Green Howard's Yorkshire battalion. Um, he parachutes in on D-Day. Um, and he is part of the um, securing of Breville. I mean, you know this all very well. I, I'm not an expert on D-Day at all. I can guarantee me and Colin and maybe Megan Mag will be going up and paying a visit to his grave within a few, few days of that. I hope I'm so. Sure. I would like a better photo. Pretending how much we know about photo. him. That would be brilliant. If you could I, do that, I will that'd do be that great. for you this week. Yeah. That'd be great. Um, and and I, I think I know of a few more Spaniards, and I'll track those down for you. But basically... He he gets injured in the big counterattack that takes place on the 12th of June, the one where the CO is killed. And basically, um, he is he's buried uh, there, as you can see. And um, um, he dies of his wounds, uh, I think, the, thir the, the 13th of June. Um, Joe Ridala, Jose Ridala, he, he joins... Um, and by the way, both of these join the army generally first. Um, I think... Um, Lucio Saquillo joins the Rimi and then um, Joey Dalla joins the Armoured Corps. Joey Dalla joins the Reconnaissance um, Corps. He's part, he becomes part of the 1st Airborne Reconnaissance Squadron and he's parachuted in to Arnhem on the 17th of September. He joins up with his lieutenant, his troop commander. He then They then rejoin the squadron eventually. And on the 20th of September, he ends up being uh, at the Hartenstein Hotel, and sadly, when a, a self-propelled gun is um, is coming in a German one, he gets hit by my, by machine gun fire, and he dies the following day. I think it's the twenty first or the twenty second. He dies. Um, but in a nutshell, yeah, twenty second. It says on the gravestone there. I can see that. Um, so yeah, um, so so yeah, very brave man. And there's a lot of a lot of thing positive things. I mean, he he he's mentioned in quite a few books. Is uh, is Joey Della. So there's some sad stories. Yeah, but there's didn't remember Arnhem angle. by John Farley. Different now 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 I'm yeah yeah remembering 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 Arnhem. Yeah, he's in that, and he's and he's also mentioned in um, he's also mentioned in at at Arnhem. Uh, oh, I can't remember what's called now. Yeah, with Reki Atarnum. He's also mentioned him with Reki Atarnum as well. Oh, the, 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 Mark Gallagher. Yeah, yeah, I haven't got that one yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's quite good. Um, yeah, so 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 there's the, those two, and then top right hand corner. You know, I mentioned um, you know I mentioned the four Spaniards who were in the Middle East commandos who go to Crete, who escape, and yeah. then end up rejoining the first fifth battalion, Queen's Royal Regiment. Well, there they are. They're in that photo somewhere. I'm not, not sure. Not sure where. One of them, a guy called Private Jose Villanova, he ends up going on a rec reconnaissance patrol. If this is early 19, uh, early October 1943, crossing of the Volturnos north of Naples. Now I'm based in Naples at the moment, um, and I haven't visited the battle uh, yet, but I will be very very shortly. Um, uh, the amazing story. He gets he gets uh, a military medal for going on a reconnaissance patrol and then on a fighting patrol. He and another Spaniard called Esteve cross the river on this reconnaissance patrol, armed only with grenades. They then crawl down the bank. They find out where the enemy positions are. They then join the patrol a couple of days later. And um, um, uh, Villanova is injured quite badly, but takes out a a uh, uh, German machine gun nest in the process, saving the patrol, and is is awarded an immediate uh, military medal in the process. Sadly, that's the end of his military career. Another Spaniard called Mena, he's got an amazing story as well. He's injured in Crete. He's taken prisoner. He is then repatriated in 1943 via Barcelona, and rejoins the battalion and lands. At uh, in, I think it's on D-Day. I'm not sure, sure if they land on D-Day shortly after and ends up with the battalion all the way through to Hamburg and is mentioned in dispatches in 1945 in Germany. So 
those are the the kind of the four from the Queen's Royal Regiment West West Surrey. And the final one is the guy, very faded photo. This is a pretty amazing story as well. This is Jose Canovas, uh, Sergeant Jose Canovas. Jose, Jose Canovas was a Spaniard whose family had emigrated to France in the early 1900s, but then rejoined Spain when the Republic was declared, but then had to leave again in the Spanish Civil War. And he ended up joining the pioneers in North Africa in 1943. He volunteered to go into the SOE, did parachute training, became a member of the parachute regiment, and was parachuted in in August 1944 with the Spanish Maquis, who were already there, to liberate Foix in the south of France. He was injured, shot in the leg. He was personally responsible for taking several positions in Foix and allowed the, um, the, the, the city, the town, to be, um, to be liberated by the Maquis. And he was awarded a military medal for, for his actions as well. So that, that really brings all of the kind of general stories together. And really, the, the last bit is, um, is about the end of the war, um, which is the last slide, really. Um, and, and what I've got here is some photos of some of the Spaniards uh, at the end of the war or after the war. Top right hand corner, uh, you've got your friend of mine, uh, Rafael Ramos, with his wife. She was Czech. Um, they ended up um, settling initially in Exeter, moving to Birmingham. He worked in the print industry. He sadly died at an early age in the 1950s. Uh, really, really sad, but was a union met rep. He met, um, he, he met um, at an SAS reunion in 1946. He met uh, uh, Ernest Bevan, was able to get a union card and uh, was able to get work. Um, next to him, you've got the photo of Francisco Jerónimo. Um, he was one of many Spaniards, in fact, who ended up marrying a Basque refugee child. He um, uh, and I've been speaking to uh, a lot to his grandson, um, Phil Williams. Phil has been really helpful in helping me with a lot of the research on 50 Middle East Commando and the SAS. Um, so, uh, so I'm very grateful for that. And they ended up settling in in Wales. Over to the left, you've got another marriage there, and. Um, we, really, what you've got is you've got the ID card there of of Manuel Sureda, Manuel Sureda, member of 50 Middle East Commando, then ended up in the 361 um, Company um, Pioneers, ended up in the UK at the end of the war, and then if you work your way down, uh, you've got um, uh, <laughs> this is this is I like this guy Miguel Bon. I love Miguel Bon. I love his smile in that photo. This is naturalisation papers. He 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 became naturalised and changed his name to Montgomery. Of course, um, he settled down on the south coast. His 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 son has been really helpful in passing on some amazing photos. Um, and then um, and then you can see another member of the number one Spanish company there, uh, bottom left hand corner there, who settled uh, in, and became a woodworker. A lot of these people had worked in wood during the war in number one Spanish company, so he ended up working in a sawmill. Uh, an amazing story that. And then of course, if we zoom out again. Uh, you'll be able to see uh, the bottom right hand corner uh, there. Big photo that. That's that's quite an important one. Um, a lot of the Spaniards um, uh, became repoliticized in the 1950s and 60s because by then the, the Spanish exiled movement uh, from the Spanish Civil War was very much better established after the Second World War had finished. And in Britain, in the late 50s, the Spanish ex servicemen's Association was formally set up. And that was mainly thanks to um, uh, the guy who's second from the right with the glasses holding the wreath there. Yeah, that's Agustin Roaventura. Agustin Roaventura was actually one of a group of heavily politicised people who continued to fight all the way through until the, the death of Franco in 1975. But also he, he was part of a small group of Spaniards who were representatives of the Spaniards in the pioneer companies at the end of the war. 361, 362, 364 um, companies were, were told that they were going to be demobbed in Italy or in North Africa. And of course, they had nowhere to go. So he made representations, and it's very well um, documented in Hansard again, um, to uh, MPs, Labour MPs, by, of course, the end of the war. And they were a bit more sympathetic and thank Thanks to his work and the work of his group, there were about six of them who did that. Um, they were able to um, 
uh, give the Spaniards an opportunity to stay or have the option to stay in Britain. A lot of Spaniards didn't do that. They decided that they were going to leave because they felt let down by Britain, because they felt that Spain would hopefully be next. But of course, we know, having now had access to a lot of the archives, Spain was 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 being quite heavily kind of paid off um, mm. uh, and also kept sweet. And obviously, by the end of the war, it was very clear that Spain would become very strategically important to what then became NATO. And, and you know, the story goes on, the idea of the idea of um, uh, Spain being given martial aid, for example, in the 1950s, because um, NATO realised that the first physical geographical barrier between Russia and the Atlantic was probably going to be the Pyrenees, and they wanted to invest in Spain as a as a launching pad for various other things. I'm not an expert on that. I'm probably not 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 the right person to ask, but but certainly that. It's and suffice it to say, it gets a bit complicated, doesn't it? The, the it does get extremely yeah. complicated. But but really, what we're talking about overall is a group of 908 Spaniards that I have um, that I have found. I think there's about 1,200 Spaniards in total, who in their majority were born during the uh, Spanish, uh, the First World War when Spain was neutral. Spain was a neutral country and it went through its industrial revolution during, during the First World War. And in the 1920s, um, Spain was under its first dictator from the 20th century, Jose Antonio Primo de Rivera, uh, who, uh, who was general. And he, he basically um, ended up being um, the dictator in the 20s. So they went through that. Then they went through the arrival of the Spanish Republic. They went through the uh, deposing of the monarchy. They fought in the Spanish Civil War, mostly as teenagers. Uh, and then they were forced to leave their country and fight with the French and then ended up in the British Army. And then some of them ended up staying in Britain, and becoming British, and become naturalised I mean, Britain. It, it's a, it's an amazing story. My, my my closing my my comments to kind of bring my part to an end is one is your research work is just outstanding because you're doing <laughs> obviously in at least three languages, uh, um, yeah. and it's not like you're looking in one place. Not a question of going to queue yeah. and finding all the stuff in a box. There, you're having to pull it in from all sorts of seats. So, yeah, and the, and the Foreign Legion, for example, is. I've got. I mean, my my brother-in-law was was ex Foreign Legion, but they, they they until more recent they've not been particularly good at sharing their history outside of the not Legion. Not at all. Um, no. <laughs> it's a polite way of saying it. Um, yeah. and the complication within that of name change. Then you have the name changes as well. So you're looking for people yeah. in telephone directories of a different name to the one that you're actually um, searching. So that's yeah. complicated. And also the fact that not as much has been been written about this. So that that's that's that my first that's my first comment. The second thing is. I love this idea again of reminding everybody that World War II isn't just the the one nation fighting the one nation. Yeah, you know, exactly. yeah, we talk about it all the time. The war movies where everybody's either upper class British, there's no brown faces, no coloured faces, no this, and and this is a, another reminder that an aw, you know, awfully widespread group of people were fighting in in the the same cause for different yeah. motivations from different places, but they were fighting together against whatever you want to label it, fascism, Nazism, the Third Reich, evil, whatever it was. So that, that's my second guy. And yeah. then the third one is just what an outstanding show it's been. I mean, just people have really, really enjoyed it. And um, yeah. and that's great. So you, you say you're kind of, the, the book is um, sort of imminent-ish, but are there any, you know, clearly you say you've got these gaps in certain people's um, careers. Is yeah. there one kind of big thing you haven't discovered yet? Is there one, you know, I think, uh, yeah, I think the, 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 the biggest aspect that sticks out that I need to work on, I need to find out more, is about the, the Spaniards' role in North Africa. Um, the SOE and all of that, there is a lot of work there. There are some specific individuals I'd like to know more about, but uh, but I think there are some really good um, there are some really good stories that still need to be found. But I think I think overall, I'll probably end up writing this book, finishing this, and I think there's probably three or four more books to come. You know, this book will I, be I an see introduction. It being the kind of thing that the book will provoke conversation. It's that you know, if I've interviewed veterans in the past, you ask them questions and they don't want to answer. But if you take them a book that someone else has already done, they'll say, that's wrong, that's wrong. Let me tell you about that. You need something yeah. to kind of be the starting point. No, I totally agree. And, and, and uh, you'll need to have a, you know, a website that supports it and have yeah. be contactable, because I'm sure yeah. people come forward and say, you know what? 
my great grandfather, my great uncle, my yep. because it seems that there are more stories out there. Uh, that, that oh, there are, and I think um, for me, it, th this book is more more about a testimony of their service and telling that story that hasn't been told. And in the back of the book, um, I will have a list of all of those 908 men that I've tracked down so that people can find, you know, I've been very grateful to a lot of people. A lot of people have given me a lot of support on this. Mm. It's not just me. I'm just bringing a lot of things together. You know, the Pioneer Corps archives, several museums, several archives, all of the families, the families have been amazing. You know, other writers, you know, Spanish, Spanish writers, Spanish academics, uh, French writers, French academics. Everybody's been really, really helpful and asked me, you know, really, really good, um, really good uh, kind of. Uh, just because David Ebsworth just said, are you in contact with Bob Cole at Rouen University? No, I'm not. Great knowledge of Spaniards in North Africa, he says. I will, so, I will uh, write there, that there's a potential lead Bob. Uh, that, 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 if that's that's cool. one thing maybe will come out of this for you so that's great yeah um, i'm sure so david get in touch with me or get in touch i don't know whether you're on twitter david but get in touch with either with me or sean <laughs> sean's email address is on that slide there uh the bottom so david yeah. if you want to happy to happy to email sean take a screen grab of that or something or contact him on twitter then you can put um the two of you in touch because that would be fantastic if we can get you a lead out of this show it would be fantastic. yeah that'd be great and thanks yeah the more the, the merrier of the internet and youtube isn't it you know so <laughs> i mean i i'm really pleased now that i ended up with this kind of random week because you contacted me and i didn't know quite how to what to fit your <laughs> show into as much as i wanted to do it's like what what it's not north africa it's not it's not one yeah theater, know, it's not yeah. I'm so glad we've done it because it's just an amazing. Francois Gosselin, my French friend in Normandy, another tour guide. His family is all Spanish, so he's he's been watching it. He, he he's yeah, he's, he's always talking about that big French Spanish connection of people big time, yeah. the Pyrenees and things, and it's just an important aspect of history. So I think we will bring things to an end now. I mean, absolutely amazing stuff. So yeah, if people have got any information, contact you as you as usual. Yeah, you're, please. Check me out on Patreon. Check me and Sean out on Twitter. If you've got any leads for Sean, please get in touch. Um, I'll just remind people what we've got coming up tomorrow, and I'll come and say goodbye in a second. So tomorrow night, folks, we're off to talk about the Battle of Mayenne, 77 years ago this week. This is a sort of lower part of Normandy. This is post-Cobra and Falaise, well, sort of leading up to Falaise Gap, off towards um, Paris, basically. Uh, the night US 90th division involved in that. Kevin uh, Himmel is coming on to talk about that. That will be great. Then lots more shows later in a week. But right now, I will say thank you very much for joining us. And did you enjoy I mean, I, I was going to say, did you enjoy it? But I can tell by your presentation <laughs> style, you you enjoy <laughs> talking about this subject. And, I do, sadly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the thing is, as I said, you know, before we went live, I knew this would be a subject most people watching wouldn't have known much about. And, uh, yeah. and that's no offense to anybody, and myself included. I'm so glad that we can do these sorts of shows where we bring essentially completely new stories but i like yeah, tackling well, the old chestnuts well, of arnhem and normandy but you know yeah well thanks for having me on um, yeah thanks for having me on it's been great to to be able to pass the message on that's the whole idea really and thanks yeah. thanks for that and we will be off to R ronville to get photos if, if there's any other cemeteries you'd like to us to go and investigate and take great photos of we'll do that for you so that'd um, be brilliant. That'd be brilliant thank you okay then folks well this has been brilliant i will see you all again tomorrow evening for the show about my end this is paul Woodhouse for world war ii tv saying enjoy the rest of your day thank you for watching everybody Goodbye.